so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Just a heads up before we jump in, this episode contains discussions of murder, sexual assault and abuse. Listener discretion is advised. Edward Joseph Leonsky leans out of his cell at Pentridge Prison, catching the attention of the guard watching over him. Why do you have a long face? He jokes. I'm the one they're going to hang. It's 1942 in wartime Melbourne, but instead of being at Camp Pell with the rest of the United States Army, 24-year-old Private Leonsky is locked up alone in a cell designed for 12 people, spending his days drawing obscene sketches and reading up on Ned Kelly. All eyes are on him, and for Eddie, the attention is intoxicating as he enjoys a steady stream of visitors, guards, police, even a priest. He's been sentenced to death by hanging on November 9 at 6am. But it doesn't appear to faze him. He knows he just has to step in front of the executioner, take a deep breath and it'll all be over. But for the city of Melbourne, they'll be left with the horrors he bestowed on them as the brown-out strangler. A serial killer with a sick obsession for women's voices. I'm Gemma Barth, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with author Ian W. Shaw. Ian's an acclaimed writer of narrative nonfiction who's made an important contribution to Australian history and to the understanding of our nation. He's the author of six books, including Murder at Dusk, which tells the story of how US soldier and smiling psychopath Eddie Leonsky terrorised wartime Melbourne. Ian, let's start with some context. 1942 in Australia, where were we at in terms of the war? We were in a lot of strife and there was a general expectation that Japanese would land. In early 1942, on the 15th of February, 15,000 Australian soldiers in Singapore were surrendered to the Japanese. And they represented probably the most potent fighting force we had out there. And suddenly we don't have them anymore. Within four days of that, the Japanese bombed Darwin. There were reported sightings of Japanese ships and aircraft all across northern Australia. Most of them were false, but there was a belief that we were in real trouble when it came to repelling the Japanese threat. What had happened, though, was an American reinforcements convoy led by a cruiser called the Pensacola was taking a lot of American troops, Army and Air Force, to the Philippines because they'd been attacked as well. Now, that convoy was redirected to Australia, so suddenly we've lost 15,000 of our own troops in Singapore, suddenly about the same number of Americans arrived in Australia, particularly in Melbourne. So it was a period of Australian history where we went from deep despair to glimmers of hope. America had been, well, called itself the arsenal of democracy. And in the Western world, at least, America was seen as the great white hope that if all else failed, the US Army, US Air Force, US Navy were the strongest in the world and would defeat any major threat we faced or they faced. So we've got these 15,000 American soldiers, a lot of them in Melbourne. Where were they being housed? The main camp in Melbourne was called Camp Pell. And if you know Melbourne, it's where Royal Park in Carlton Parkville is. It's alongside the zoo and it's a massive park and that had been a camp for people doing it tough during the Depression. It had been like a welfare area and it was handed over by, I think, the Victorian government to the federal government who then said to the Americans when it became obvious that all these troops would arrive, well, we can give you this area. There's some permanent buildings, timber buildings, but there's enough space for the thousands of tents that you're going to need to house your men. And that's how 
that came about. Later on, there were also American units at the Melbourne Cricket Ground was taken over, South Melbourne Cricket Ground, just small units based away from the main Camp Pell. For a lot of Melbournians and Australians during this time, there were things called brownouts. Now, for those that didn't live through the war, what on earth is a brownout? A brownout is a partial blackout. In the United Kingdom in particular, they went straight to blackouts. Every visible light was turned off at night so that German bombers didn't have anything to guide them to their targets. So the blackout was designed to stop any light escaping anywhere to give the enemy a sense of direction or where things were. In Australia, we didn't face the threat that the British did with German bombers overhead every night. But there were sightings of German and Japanese submarines. There were reports of Japanese aircraft flying over Melbourne, flying over Sydney. So to perhaps not stop reconnaissance from happening. But to make it more difficult, we went to a brownout. And that involved things like every second or third streetlight would be removed. Cars could have headlights, but they had to be taped over so there's only a narrow beam of light. Just things like that. It wasn't a blackout, but it was a step along the path of blackouts. I guess it would kind of feel a bit like a blackout when you're walking down a street, though, because if the streetlights are down, the headlights aren't there, I'm imagining it would feel pretty damn black. It was, yeah, especially you know, the period we're talking about, summer's over, the days are getting shorter, the nights are getting longer. You know, I wasn't there either, but my parents were, and yeah, they felt it was pretty close to being a blackout. Let's get back to the American soldiers. What were they like? Because, you know, there's 15,000 young men who have descended on a foreign land. Were they having a good time? What were they like? They were overpaid, oversexed and over here is what it came to be known as. There's a book with that title just telling the story of Americans abroad. But to begin with, because they were here to save us and the community knew that our only hope was through the Americans, they were welcomed with, with open arms, literally. The Australian experience of the United States was pretty much Hollywood and Hollywood portrayed blonde, blue-eyed, tall cowboys. And then the Americans arrived, and a lot of them were blonde, blue-eyed, healthy-looking specimens. I don't know whether you've seen photos of the Australian Army uniforms from the time. They were terrible. The jackets, I think they're called Norfolk jackets, and they were World War I British Army reject uniforms. And the Americans arrived, and the Americans wore tailored uniforms. Our uniforms are that really rough, wool that irritates your skin when it touches it. The Americans had wool cotton mix. They looked literally a million dollars and they were paid, I think the exact rate was about two and a half times what the Australian soldiers at equivalent ranks got. Australia was a very conservative society back in those days. America was a lot more open then than in some places it is now. So you had 15,000 young men with lots of money to spend in the big smiles, and my mother recollected also they could get nylon stockings, so they were very popular. You couldn't get those in Australia. So they had access through their PX, their canteens, to a lot of goods that were rationed in Australia. So, yeah, they were, as I said, overpaid, oversexed and over here. Uh, they were loved from basically the moment they arrived. Now, one of these soldiers, his name was Edward Joseph Leonsky. What kind of guy was he to his peers? To his peers, he was quite a frightening man. He was immensely strong. He was very, very strong-willed as well as being physically strong. And he was the typical square peg in a round hole. He just didn't fit in the American Army. And I think the only reason he was in the American Army was one of the alternatives that faced him was prison time. But he was a petty criminal from New York who... For reasons that we can only speculate about, joined the US Army to get away from a number of situations, one of which was a criminal situation, and the second one was he was having an affair with his brother's wife. So there were lots of reasons for him to get away from what had been a pretty ordinary upbringing too. Let's talk a bit more about his upbringing, because when you do go into the detail, he had 
an abusive dad, an abusive stepdad. He had quite a hard childhood, didn't he? He did. It's difficult, you know, looking back, because lots of people have lots of difficulties in their childhood and don't become what Eddie would become. But, yeah, he did it tough. I think his mother was definitely, I think she was brain damaged from a combination of being beaten regularly by firstly her husband and his, or both husbands. Both those husbands were alcoholics. I'm not certain that Eddie's mother was, but she lived in very, very challenging circumstances. One of Eddie's brothers, Arthur, would spend most of his life in an asylum, was just clearly clinically insane. So he grew up in a house that there was a lot of violence. They didn't have a lot of money coming into the house, and what money came in was generally spent on alcohol. Eddie learned early in his life that if he wanted to get something, he had to get it himself, that he couldn't really rely on other family members. His sister Helen was always good to him. His mother loved him unconditionally, but, you know, it was just a very ordinary upbringing. Well, you say he had a lot of alcoholism around him, and would you say that he grew up to be an alcoholic? Because it sounds like he enjoyed the drinks, especially when he was in Melbourne. Yeah, look, clinically he certainly was an alcoholic. He used alcohol not as a, a kind of social tool to win friends and influence people. He used alcohol to get drunk. And when he got drunk, he became a different person. He became a person that was not nice in any way, shape or form. He abused friends, he abused colleagues, he abused his fellow soldiers. And ultimately that led to a, a series of very, very violent crimes in Melbourne. There was a side of Edward's personality that wasn't so obvious to his peers that I want to bring in here. Tell me about his obsession with women's voices. This is, a, as you said, quite a fascinating story. It comes about after he's getting into quite serious trouble and after he saw a film, Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, and in that film, Mr Hyde, who's Jekyll's alter ego, becomes a murderer claiming that he wants to capture voices, capture these women's voices. I'm pretty certain, and I think I can prove it, that Eddie saw the film in Melbourne, but he had a, a fascination with women before, and I don't think anyone can be certain whether or not what he spoke about is, you know, he wanted to collect voices, women's voices, whether that's a drunken fantasy, whether it's something that sat at the back of his mind after seeing the film, whether he thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll escape serious punishment if I can put this forward as a reason for doing what I did. But yeah, he all along said, yeah, look, I have this fascination with women's voices and we'll never know. I know that there's a link that people make between his mother, who used to sing him to sleep, and then how this obsession might have come about. Do you see that link? Do you think there's something there? I do, because Eddie was very much the archetypical male who puts all women into one of two categories, the Madonna or the whore. And to Eddie, the Madonnas were the ones that sang, that had the beautiful voices. And everyone else, including women who were just lovely, lovely women, he would read their behaviour as representing something which it didn't. So initially, before we get into his crimes, to feed this, I guess, obsession with this Madonna-type woman, he would seek out bars with women singing and that kind of thing. Yeah, he had a very utilitarian approach to women in that he would use them physically, sexually, emotionally, and he was an attractive man. I don't really have seen photos of him. Most of them probably don't do him justice, but... To look at, he was a you know, six foot tall, blonde, blue eyed. Big smile. Yeah, yeah, fantastic physique. He was manipulative, so he knew the right things to say, when to say them, how to say them. And I think he used that to get closer to women because to me, he was always looking for something in womanhood, in femininity, that he could never find. That he wanted all the women to be like his mother to be lovers as well. And there's this terrible dichotomy between what he wanted and what the reality of life 
was. And I think it was that dichotomy, that kind of cognitive dissonance that broke him in the end. Let's go to the night of May 2. So May 2, 1942. What was Eddie doing that night? Eddie was drinking. Uh, Of course. (laughs) Yes. um, This is the Ivy McLeod night. Can I give a bit of background saying that Camp Pell would have been the most poorly organised army facility in the world in 1942. It's a big call. Well, yeah, I'll stand by it until (laughs) someone proves otherwise. It had 15,000 American troops there. They had no idea from one day to the next and possibly one hour to the next who was actually in the camp and who wasn't. Notionally, they all did basically a nine-to-five day and would then have leave passes to go into the CBD of Melbourne, but no one seemed to know how many were in the camp today, tonight, tomorrow morning. The soldiers just pretty much came and went as they pleased. So May the 2nd, typical day for Eddie, he was probably on breakfast duty, which was helping serve, cleaning up afterwards. He would have been finished by 11 o'clock and go out drinking. And that day he went down to St Kilda to a couple of hotels down there and he would drink with a group and be friendly and then would drift away and he was a loner but he liked to give the appearance that he's one of the boys so that he was doing that that day and he just drank well into the evening. Ivy McLeod you mentioned her earlier she was also out that night what was her story who was she? Ivy was a lovely almost middle-aged woman who'd done it tough She'd been married. She, it will sound pejorative, but she was a kind of background figure. She was never at the forefront of things. She just went about living her life quietly. There were things in her background that she'd been married. She'd had an abortion. She was probably incapable of having children. Her boyfriend, who's an ex-army guy now working in a war industry, didn't know this. He believed they'd have a future together. She believed that she wasn't a party girl at all. So that night she'd been out visiting friends. I think she called in to see her fiance and then said she was going to see her girlfriend. This was down in Albert Park, Middle Park area, which is next to some children in Melbourne. And she was living in East Melbourne and thought, I'll get a tram home, went to the tram stop to catch a tram home late at night, very late at night. Yeah, it was about 2.30 or 2.45 a.m., wasn't it? And this is where she runs into Eddie. Yes, yeah. Eddie had kind of gone past the stage of, you know, I've drunk enough. He, I think, was getting a bit sour. He'd been drinking with other Americans and Australians and there was a woman there and she kissed him and he thought her breath smelt of tobacco, I think. So he was just drifting, feeling bitter about his life, about failure to be one of the group that were going to go somewhere else to kick on drinking. And he was walking basically aimlessly from St Kilda Beach up to Middle Park Beach, Albert Park. I'm not even certain he thought he was going to get a tram home or anything, but he was just wandering past a closed hotel and there was an alcove into a couple of shops next door to the hotel and glanced in there and saw a woman. She got a fright, he got a fright, and he, he stepped in and just said, look, you've got nothing to worry about. I'm a soldier, I'm safe. And he put his arm on her shoulder and the next thing he strangled her, killed her. So Ivy's body was found the next day, well, at dawn the next day. And it... <sighs> Talking about this, like the way she was found, it's horrific. Like what had happened to her? It is. As I was saying before, he had this kind of bifurcation of all women into Madonnas and whores. And I think he believed that knowing who he was, any woman who would let him get not just physically intimate, but allow him into her space, well, by her behaviour, I'm a bad man, she must be a bad woman. And to show his total disgust at the woman, he would tear their clothes up above their waist and down to their waist. So their entire pubic area, their breasts would be exposed and he would arrange the body in a way that the first thing anyone saw was this semi-naked body with the legs literally spread apart 
it's telling the world how they should view this woman that this is a woman who didn't know me from a bar of soap and yet she was happy for me to buy her drinks and give her a kiss and cigarettes. So, you know, this is what happens to women like that and the world needs to know exactly what they were. It's a very, very primitive approach to human relations. So he did it. He murdered and then set the scene for whoever was going to find the murder victim. And it was just an aggressive debasing scene that he set for people who found the bodies. And you said that he would strangle these women. Did he sexually assault them as well? He always claimed he didn't. He said he had consensual sex with the second victim. I'm not not certain of that. I think he may have had post-mortem sex with the second victim. The others, no. And there may have been physiological reasons for that. He was quite a twisted human being when it came to physical relationships. You alluded to this at the start of our chat, but this wasn't the first kind of, I mean, this was a very big escalation, but it wasn't the first kind of run-in he'd had with women and crime. What had he done back in America? I don't know, and I don't think anyone does know, the extent of his crimes in New York City, particularly sexually based crimes. But When he was uh, in the army travelling across the United States to get to San Francisco and the convoy that would bring him to Australia, there was a stopover in Texas, I think San Antonio, and he got drunk. There was an army, big army base, and nearby were bars and and that. And there was a young, I think part Mexican prostitute who, I don't know how he inveiled her into it, but he attacked her in an alleyway and tried to strangle her. She blacked out. And whether or not a police car went past or another soldier saw it, but he didn't kill her. He went very close to strangling her. He was detained. It's always his word against her word. You know, she's 18 year old Mexican prostitute. He's, you know, six foot blonde, blue eyed GI Joe. So he got away with that. He also, I think it was in San Francisco the night before they were on the convoy, spoke about going AWOL. He missed his mother. He broke down in tears, you know, I want my money, that kind of thing. But he was drunk. And this is a guy who spent a large part of his waking life drinking. So back to Ivy and the barman who found her in the position that you mentioned before, he kind of saw a glimpse of him, didn't he? He saw the American uniform. Yes, he did. He saw a figure going away from the alcove and it was a a US soldier wearing an army uniform. And I believe he also recognised the cap. But like all uniforms, there are specific elements of it that tell you specific things. And US Army uh, soldiers on overseas deployment wear an overseas cap. It's like Air Force ones that we wear. So it's for enlisted men. It's not an officer's one. So straight up authorities knew that in that area, around the time that Ivy was murdered, was at least one American soldier below the rank of a sergeant type thing. Do American authorities cooperate? Do they help out Australian authorities as they investigate this horrible crime? Not initially, because I believe their response would have been, you've got an Australian woman dead, you've got an American soldier in the vicinity. They're two separate events. You haven't linked those two events. Until you do, we will support your investigation, but we won't do our own investigation because we don't think it's anything to do with us. That attitude would change markedly, but it was an attitude that grated with a lot of the Australian investigators. And right up until the end of the story, or at the end of Eddie's story, there was a quite a palpable tension between Victorian police and US Army Provost who were doing investigations on their side. And I think it's important to point out, you know, the 1940s, there's no CCTV, there's no forensics like we've got today. So what do police of the time have to go off with this initial murder? Do they have any clues apart from that uniform? No, nothing beyond trying to trace Ivy's movements. The boyfriend came forward as soon as he went off it through the newspaper or radio and he said yeah look ivy spent 
two and a half hours at my house in South Melbourne that night. We drank a bottle of beer. We spoke about a possible future together. And then Ivy said she had to catch up or wanted to catch up with another friend before she went home. So you know, I took her to the front door, shook her hand and said goodbye at you know, 11, 11.30, whatever the time was. Forensically, there was a little bit of evidence, the strangulation, and she had a fractured skull as well because Eddie was very, very strong, physically strong, and he had a particular technique that he would hone over the, the next few weeks of holding the victim in place with his right arm and his left arm was the strongest, and suddenly just whipping the left arm across to the front of the throat and squeezing as hard as he could, and Eddie could squeeze very hard. So Ivy would have had a nanosecond of thinking, what's happening here? And then because of the way Eddie did it, cut off all supply immediately to the brain. So she would have passed out within less than a second, would have been a tenth of a second, then let the body go, and that was when I suspect she hit the concrete at the bottom of the alcove and fractured his skull. So they knew he was immensely strong, possibly an American soldier. If he was an American soldier, what was he doing there? Well, let's start investigating what Americans were doing that night. Now, this surprised me because Eddie goes back to camp and confesses to a fellow soldier. Yeah. Eddie was manipulative. He would use the truth or pieces of the truth or outright lies to put himself in a better light or a better position than he might otherwise be. Joey Gallo was a fellow New Yorker, small, he was picked on a lot, but Eddie took Joey under his wing. Eddie just stepped in and said, anyone who annoys my little mate, who picks on my little mate, you'll answer to me. And people were physically scared of him because he was a tough guy. Well, Joey doesn't tell anyone, and your description of Eddie being his protector kind of explains why a little bit, because this is the guy that's looking out for him. Yep. And also, would he have believed something like that? No, I don't think so. I, look, I don't think Joey wanted to be in the Army, didn't want to be in Melbourne, didn't want to be in a ward. And the only real thing Joey had going for him was Eddie. Joey lacked confidence as a person, as a soldier, as a you know, serving private in the US Army. And to be honest, they weren't engaged in frontline soldiering. These are minor clerical duties both of them had. So there was a lot bubbling away below the surface for not just Eddie, but for Joey Gallo and a number of others as well. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with author Ian W. Shaw about Eddie Leonsky, the brownout strangler. Let's skip forward to the evening of May 9. So this is where Eddie's second victim, Pauline Thompson, comes into the story. Who was she? Pauline was a young woman, a young mother, who... I think was struggling a bit in her marriage. She was married to a, a policeman that were based in Bendigo. She was quite a talented entertainer, a singer, and a hostess of some note in that she could organise things and get the band together to play and get the girls from the typing pool to come along to dance with the soldiers. And she worked at a radio station. She was a lovely young woman, dressed well, looked the part, and had the misfortune to meet Eddie. How do they meet on that night? One of Pauline's roles was to put together social opportunities for the US soldiers. And it might be a dance, it might be a radio show, it might be a meet and greet. And there will be people who think that she was having affairs with American soldiers willy-nilly, and I'm not one of those people. I think she was attracted to a couple of them. And there was one younger man that she may have had a fling with. And she was to meet him that night at a club in, I think it was in Spencer Street in Melbourne, a servicemen's club. And he arrived late. By the time he'd arrived, Eddie had met Pauline and said, looks like you've been stood up. I'm 
you know, be interested in having a drink, and, and they just went off drinking, the two of them. The young American arrived later, no sign of Pauline, went to her boarding house in Spring Street, no sign of her there. So he went back to Camp Hill and went to bed. And while all that was happening, Pauline and Eddie went to at least, I think, two hotels, but one in particular, which is no longer there. They spent quite a bit of time drinking there. How similar was the way Pauline died to the way Ivy died? Because they were found in very similar circumstances the day after they were killed. Yeah, I think it was identical. I think I wrote in the book, and this is my best guesstimate, that Pauline said, okay, it's early hours, I've got to go back to the boarding house, I'm working tomorrow. Eddie would have said, oh, I'll walk you there. It was an old terrace place. It had a front gate and steps leading up to a a landing and a front door, and I think probably at least four units inside. They had a cigarette at the top of the stairs. I think probably Pauline said, okay, good night, kiss, and I might see you again. And I think she tilted her head back for a kiss and just grabbed her by the throat, attacked her immediately. Same technique. Pauline was a lot stronger than Ivy. She didn't die instantly. They struggled, probably would have taken up to a minute for him to choke her, and then he kept his hands around her throat till he was certain she was dead. Then I believe that he arranged the clothes as he had with all the others and may have sexually assaulted her at that point, grabbed her bag, her handbag, walked away. It was like this irresistible urge to kill her at that particular time and that particular place, just same with Ivy. Everything else disappeared out of his mind. So after this second murder, how is Australia and particularly Melbourne reacting? Because it's two murders, the same MO. Were women afraid? Yes, they were. They were very afraid. My mother and two of the sisters were in Melbourne during this period. And they said it was almost overnight. It went from we love Americans to we hate Americans. We're scared of Americans. Because Pauline had last been seen socially drinking with an American and had been at the American Service Club before. And suddenly it's, well, hang on, are, are these our saviors? Or is there one or more of them who are our killers? My father and a number of uncles were also in the services during the war. And a couple of them were in Melbourne. And they said, if you're an Australian serviceman, here's your chance to get couple back at the Americans. So a lot of American soldiers were beaten up by groups of Australian soldiers who just said, okay, you're American, you might be one of the killers because we think there's more than one out there. And Melbourne was full of young women. The young men are off in uniform. There's lots of work down here, highly paid work, like Pauline in the entertainment industry, like others in war-related industries. So it's a magnet for young women from all over, not just Victoria, from all over Southern Australia. And to have died, you have employers concerned about the safety and well-being of their young female staff. So a lot of change happened very, very quickly. Well, it didn't stop or it didn't come quick enough to stop him from attacking a third woman. No. Because that happens, you know, days later, May 17. Tell me about Gladys Hosking. Gladys was another older woman. And, you know, we've talked around this, that two of the three victims were middle-aged probably within a few years of the age of his mother. I've never seen photos of his mother, so I can't comment on physical similarities. But Gladys had come to Melbourne from Perth, and she was quite a cultured woman. She was working at Melbourne University in the chemistry department as a secretary there. So she she also organised a lot of social things, but more on the high culture rather than low culture. She had the misfortune to meet Eddie after knocking off work one night. It was dark. It was rainy. As best we can trace, she went to a milk bar. She lived not far from where she worked at Melbourne Uni. Walked down Sydney Road to a milk bar, was exiting the milk bar, met Eddie. And Eddie could be very, very charming. So he spoke to her, talked about the weather, they walked along the edge of Royal Park, which was you know, 400 metres from Camp Pell. And at some stage, they walked past her home, 
I think they were together for well over an hour, maybe more. But at some stage, she crossed the road with Eddie to the Royal Park side of Gatehouse Avenue, and a similar thing, out of the blue, for no apparent reason, he just snapped and murdered her on a pile of clay that had been dug out to create slip trenches uh, in case we ever got bombed. So it was wet, it was muddy, it was a terrible night, and again, he murdered her on top of this pile of clay, rearranged the body, the clothes in the usual format, then staggered you know, 400, 500 metres to, to the tent where he was uh, staying with the other soldiers. I wanted to point out here as well, just for listeners who might have forgotten when we set up the brownouts, that all of these murders are happening in a very dark Melbourne, like in the shadows, basically. So he's gotten away with these murders where it's already a bit freaky walking around in the middle of the night, but, you know, there's this killer on the loose in the dark. (laughs) And I think that ties in for me with the fact that the Americans still had no idea who was actually in camp and who was not in camp that Eddie had gone AWOL, he got involved with some Australian, well, they sounded like our army deserters, minor gangsters had been beaten up. There were just a lot of things happening. And as you said, they were happening literally in the dark. Where Gladys was murdered, there were a line of army trucks, there were guards. So he had no compunction about it. When the urge to kill, and that's what it was. When the urge to kill hit Eddie, he would kill irrespective of the circumstances. Gladys was his last victim. How is he caught after that murder? She was his last murder victim, but again, I would estimate that there are at least two other women, one of whom he attempted to rape in St Kilda a bit earlier, and another one who he followed home again in the Parkville area, she hopped off the tram and went to her house. He followed her along the street, through the gate, and just as she went to open the front door, he grabbed her. The young woman lived with her uncle, and the door flew open and the uncle was inside and he called her, you know, what do you think you're doing there? And Eddie took off. But they both had a pretty good glimpse of him, so much so that by now the provost authorities, US Army Provost, are working with the Victorian Police Homicide Squad and a number of identification parades would be held. Now, the first one totally missed everything. There was no recognition of anyone. But the second parade, the young woman, her uncle and a couple of other people who may have witnessed Eddie were just standing there in the rain under an umbrella and the American soldiers were marched past them in single file and no recognition at all. And as the parade that the Americans had been called to was breaking up, the uncle was standing there talking to, I think he was talking to Sid McGuffey, the lead homicide detective, and a group of Americans walked past him and the uncle said, hang on, that's him there. So they detained this American soldier on the spot and said, who are you? And he said, I'm Eddie Leonsky. And that was it. It was as simple as that. But they tried lots of things. There were clues they'd missed, there were angles they chose not to investigate, and the uncle of the last victim, just one fleeting glimpse of the other team. And then once caught, Eddie was a bit of an open book, wasn't he? He confessed. He rolled over. He at first said, no, it's not me, I don't know what you're talking about. And the evidence was just so overwhelming. The mud from the... um, clay where he'd murdered Gladys was all over his clothes, all over his tent, his bed. He tried to wash it out. He'd been seen and identified with other people at or near the crime scenes. And he just said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And they walked him around Parkville to the various sites that had been important in his drinking and killing. And I think it was on the way back to Camp Hell, he said to McGuffey, what will I get if I confess? And it was, oh, can't say, but let's negotiate. And eventually, very quickly, Eddie just did confess to everything. Did he give any explanation as to why he went on this murderous rampage? None beyond the overwhelming force 
within him that he couldn't control, that it was like there was a beast living inside me and when he comes out, I do things that I would not normally do. So it was a an attempt at a mental impairment defence. It wouldn't hold up in court, but he spoke quite freely about what he did, how he did it, why he did it, when he did it. And at one stage when he's being held in, in what's now the old Melbourne jail, Eddie was just a changed character. Once he was caught, he went from kind of lion to lamb. And he said to Sid McGuffey, Sid, do you want to know how I do it? And McGuffey said, oh, not particularly, but you obviously want to show me. And it was, Eddie had the largest cell of all in, in the old Melbourne jail. And you can go and visit him and sit where he sat. And they had US Army MPs throughout his part of the jail. And I think it was four or six of them stood there with pistols in their hands and said to Eddie, you can show him, but squeeze too tight and we'll shoot you down. And Eddie said to Sid McGuffey, this is how I do it, Sid. I put my right hand here and then I hit them with my left hand. And McGuffey, who was a tough cop, he was a guy that had had a fist fight and won with Squizzy Taylor. McGuffey said, you know, click like that, I was unconscious and he let me go. So it was a demonstration of a killing technique and a demonstration of incredible strength in the forearms in particular. But otherwise, Eddie just, I think he loved the attention. Uh, he had guards all around him. He was in a cell that was designed for 12 people by himself. He could draw sketches, most of them obscene. He could talk to police on a regular basis. A priest would come in. I don't know what he thought his future would be like. I think he had a pretty good idea before the trial, but he used to have this macabre sense of humour. One of the policemen, again, it might have been Sid McGuffey, gave him a copy of the true history of the Kelly gang. And he read up on Ned Kelly and he'd say things like, I love that Ned Kelly. He sure knew how to have a good time. He sure knew how to kill him. And just this macabre sense of humour that he'd laugh at his own jokes. Then came the trial. It was literally an open and shut case. There was an attempt by the defence to suggest mental impairment, but Eddie was examined by three psychiatrists who all said, look, he's not the full quid, but he knew what he was doing, he knew that it was wrong, and he was complicit in all his actions. There might have been this, I want to catch the voices, there might have been this beast inside trying to get out, but he knew what he was doing, therefore he's fit to stand trial, therefore if he's found guilty, he, he can't get out of the hangman's way by uh, mental impairment. So what happens to him? What's his sentence? He's sentenced to death, which appears to be a bit of a relief to Eddie. He's got a brother in a mental institution in upstate New York. He said, I don't want to be like Arthur. I don't want to spend the rest of my life locked up either in a mental institute or in a prison. I'd rather die. His macabre sense of humour advanced about three notches. He'd say to the, the guards, why have you got a long face? I'm the one they're going to hang. My face will be longer than yours. Just bizarre. Yeah, totally Like psychopathic bizarre. almost. Like doesn't seem to realise what's going on or... Yeah, I think for Eddie it would have been, I'll be dead, it'll be snap and I'm dead. All my problems are over, but you have to keep living. The memories you have of me will be with you forever. Till the day you die, you'll remember Eddie Leonsky and what he said to you. Simple as that. Was the death penalty common in Australia then? That feels like a very American punishment. It wasn't unheard of in Australia, but it was becoming less and less used. The circumstances of the trial were quite unique in that Eddie Leonsky was tried before a US Army court-martial for offences that were against the Victorian Crimes Act. So there had to be a, a kind of administrative tool to allow an American court to try a man in Australia for crimes committed in Australia. So the waiver was, we'll let that happen. And uh, I think the Governor General signed a notice in council, a motion in council to allow it to happen so that the entire trial was done under US military law. The witnesses were Victorian policemen and others, but the whole passage of Eddie's legal journey 
fell under US military law, the Universal Code of Military Justice, including the death penalty. He was held in Victorian institutions, the old Melbourne jail, eventually taken out to Pentridge where he was executed. There are little bizarre elements to it, General, one of which was under Victorian law, if you're executed by hanging, your body has to be left hanging for an hour. Oh. Because so many in the 19th century weren't killed outright. They literally strangled to death and could live for quite a while after they you know, were dropped. Eddie, they made an exception to that rule too. He was executed at Pentridge Prison. The executioner was Australian. When the body dropped, it dropped into an area that was surrounded by canvas walls underneath the gallows. Within those canvas walls were two American medical staff. They weren't doctors, they were uh, medical orderlies. They gave the body a lethal injection of, just to make certain he was actually dead. General MacArthur all the way through basically said, I don't care how it happens, I want that bastard dead. So um, Eddie was never going to walk away from it. Finally, I wanted to ask you, we've got three families that have been decimated here. We've got an American soldier that's been killed because of what he's done. After researching all of this and writing a book on it, what were the lasting thoughts of this case and what happened in this period of time that stuck with you? For me, the story was, yeah, it is central to it, but I felt that the three victims and two other women that were almost victims had never been given a voice in the story of the brownout murders, call it what you will. So I wanted to see if I could make them human beings and not just names and photos. And that was, you know, I said I didn't want to see the crime scene photos because there are some beautiful photos of them as they were. And I think that kind of thing gets lost a lot in the, you know, it's exciting, it's mass murder and it's this and it's that. But, you know, it's the victims that, I don't care about Eddie. Eddie was a, a murderer. The world possibly would have been a better place had he never come to Australia. But I do care about three women who never had a chance. So that's what I took away from it. Thanks to Ian W. Shaw for assisting us to tell this story. You'll find a link to his book about Eddie Leonsky in our show notes. You'll also find a link to become a Mamma Mia subscriber. Subscribers get access to every podcast, exclusive videos, and all the great articles on Mamma Mia. And you'll be supporting our team of female journalists and producers. So a big thanks to anyone who's become one already. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, and my executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you have a case you think we should cover next, get in touch with us via email through truecrime at mamamia.com.au.